let's get started. Um, hello everyone, my name is Kai. I am a second year grad student in the UN Zao group at UC San Diego. And thank you all for attending today's installment of the Polariton Chemistry webinar series. Um, before we begin, I wanna, I'm pleased to announce um, that in the US, after pushback from the universities, the Department of Homeland Security has decided to rescind their previous policy that would have forced international students to leave the country if their schools had provided only online courses due to COVID-19. Um, we applaud the swiftness to take action by universities during these difficult and confusing times. So returning back to the normal program, we once again want to remind you that the Journal of Chemical Physics is hosting a special topic issue um, um, for polariton chemistry. Again, we encourage you all to contribute to this special issue. The submission for, or the deadline submission is October 16th. Um, and then to stay up to date with these uh, webinars, please follow our Polariton and Chemistry online community Facebook page. Um, and this page also serves as a way to communicate with other scientists in the field. So please feel free to post or discuss any papers or talks that you find interesting. We also have a Polariton Chemistry webinar YouTube channel, which we upload all of the webinar talks to. Um, and you, here you can rewatch your favorite talks, or if you were unable to attend a talk, you can watch it here as well. Um, today's webinar is the first installment of our postdoc spotlight, um, where we have two speakers give each 25 minute talks. Uh, for our next installment, we'd like to call for applicants from across the globe. So anyone can apply. Um, please submit an application through this uh, website um, by July 21st, 11.59 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, once we collect all the applications, we will then hold an online vote through which we will choose two speakers to give a talk on August 19th. Um, and again, anyone is welcome to apply. All right, so today's webinar is slightly different from typical or previous webinars. Typically, we encourage attendee participation during the talks, but today to ensure that both speakers have ample time to complete their presentations, um, we ask that you reserve your questions for the end of each talk where we will hold a five minute Q&A session. And so during this session, you may use the raise your hand option um, to ask your questions verbally. Um, when you use this option, I'll be ping to unmute your mic and then you may ask the speakers your question. And then you may write out your questions using the Q&A option and then I may read your questions to the speakers. Okay, so with that, I am honored to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Bing Gu. Uh, Dr. Gu received his bachelor's from the University of Science Technology of China. Um, he then received his PhD from the University of South Carolina under the supervision of Professor Sofa Garshunk. He then completed his postdoc with Professor Ignacio Franco from the University of Rochester, during which he explored non-nuclear matter, developed the methods for coupled electron nuclear dynamics, and studied open quantum um, system dynamics. Presently, he is a postdoc in the Mukamel group at the University of California, Irvine, and with that, Dr. Mengu, uh, the screen is yours. Uh, okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Oh, sorry. So, uh, can, I, can I speak now? Or? Okay. So, uh, uh, thanks. Uh, Thanks, Kai, for a so nice introduction. Uh, thanks, Wei and Hoel for the uh, for the uh, for the invite. Uh, so, uh, so today I'm going to uh, talk about our work on uh, uh, using the strong coupling uh, to manipulate the photochemical process. Uh, so, uh, let me start with a few words about these uh, optical cavities that we have seen uh, during essentially all our 
all the previous talks. So uh, the simplest uh, optical cavity is made of two uh, mirrors with high reflectivity. So uh, the uh, in this uh, so we sort of have some sort of confinement uh, of the electric magnetic field uh, of the uh, of the light inside the, the cavity, and the, this boundary condition gives us the discreteness of, of what of the mode that what we call the cavity modes, uh, and then. Uh, there are other types of ca uh, cavities that can do a similar type of confinement to the uh, to the light, and we have seen a beautiful example of, of this uh, plasmonic cavity of, of a nanosphere in, in surface. So uh, typically, we distinguish this uh, weak and strong uh, light metal coupling regime. So imagine we put a molecule that's a excited molecule in, in the optical cavity, uh, and then uh, what happens is that it will emit a photon to the cavity mode, uh, and then it goes back to the ground state. Uh, and, and if it leaks out of the cavity, if the photon leaks out of the cavity, then uh, we say this is a weak coupling regime. Uh, but uh, if, if the photon is trapped uh, long enough uh, that it can re-excite the molecule, uh, then it just to go back to the original uh, state. Uh, so, and we can imagine that this process can go back and forth uh, for many cycles before the photon eventually uh, escapes the cavity. Uh, and this is what we call this Rabi oscillation of, of the energy exchange between uh, material and uh, uh, cavity mode. So, uh, in, in the, so that's sort of a time domain picture. Uh, in the frequency domain, we will have a molecular transition in, in the molecule, and then we have a, a, a cavity resonance, uh, and then in uh, the strong coupling between these uh, two transitions uh, leads to two hybrid states, uh, what we call polaritons. Uh, and, and this coupling is uh, typically determined by the uh, uh, this uh, cavity frequency and the volume uh, and, the, uh, and the transition dipole. Uh, this, and um, by strong coupling, we typically consider that the G effect, the, the coupling uh, G is much bigger than the decoherence rate of, of the tran molecular transition and the uh, decay rate of the cavity resonance. So, uh, and these pariton states are typically uh, absorbed, um, can be absorbed in the uh, linear absorption spectrum uh, where we see a single uh, molecule uh, in. Uh, splits into two peaks. So this splitting is, is very similar to what, uh, to, the, to the old phenomenon of outer tongues effect uh, where, we, where we, uh, we see in the, in the molecule under a, a CW wave. So, uh, so if we consider including plane momentum uh, into a con, then we will have this beautiful uh, logo of, uh, of our community. So uh, of the last uh, 30 years, there has been a huge uh, development in the direction of uh, going in the direction of stronger and light metal coupling. Uh, so, so these two dashed lines basic marks to different regimes. So I think 10 minus one is typically what we consider as strong coupling. And then uh, the G equal to the, to the carrier frequency, I, I think people call it deep uh, coupling. Okay, so, uh, so uh, this concept of strong coupling and, and polariton is not entirely new uh, as we can find the literature in the 70s uh, uh, using atomic systems, uh, but it is relatively new that it, when it enters the uh, chemistry world. So uh, I, think, I think the first paper is back in 2012 where we can, uh, uh, it's shown by uh, Abison group that you can see uh, uh, the strong coupling effects on the chemical reactions. So I think the first example is the first photoisomerization of, of, of this molecule, uh, uh, where they show that the rate chemical reaction rate is modified by the strong coupling. Uh, more recently, there's an example of using uh, vibrational strong coupling uh, to uh, reverse the selectivity of this, of, this, uh, of this reaction. So basically without cavity, product one is favored, and then with the cavity, uh, the product two is, uh, is, is favored. So uh, here, so uh, going to our focus here, we are going to uh, see how can we take advantage of the strong coupling to, uh, uh, to modify a passage through cortical intersection dynamics. So, uh, uh, so basically a cortical intersection is a point uh, where, the, uh, the, where the energies become degenerate uh, between uh, two different surfaces. So for example, so this is a surface for the Pearson model that has been developed by uh, Domkin. Uh, group, and uh, we see that there's a cutting section between the S1 and S2 surfaces. And this surface is, is how can we, uh, how we understand, typically understand uh, for the chemical process. Uh, and this uh, presence of cutting section marks a breakdown of, of the adiabatic approximation or Oppenheimer approximation. Oppenheimer approximation. So, uh, so this model can uh, uh, that we consider here can uh, contain three electronic states. 
uh, and also two vibration mode. It's a minimal requirement to describe uh, coding plane intersection dynamics. So the so the sort of outline of this, uh, this of the next ten minute or twenty minutes is how can we uh, manipulate uh, the coding plane intersection dynamics by optical parities, uh, and, and how uh, can we observe such changes in in uh, using nonlinear spectroscopic technique uh, and uh, the last part, uh, if we have time, we uh, need to talk about how uh, the collective effects come into play uh, of, of this uh, uh, polariton dynamics. So, uh, so let's, before we put this molecule uh, into the cavity, let's see how uh, the uh, pre for the chemistry of this molecule uh, looks like. So basically, uh, the molecule stays in the ground state initially, and then there's a photo excitation process takes to the S2 state. Uh, and then it, it starts to move along the S2 surface uh, until it hits the conical intersection. So basically, uh, uh, the conical intersection, around the conical intersection, there's a strong uh, non adiabatic coupling uh, that, so the adiabatic approximation breaks down. So we will see a transition from the S2 to S1 state. Uh, and then the uh, dynamics happens, the part of the dynamics happens on the S1 state. So now let's put the molecule in the cavity. Uh, here we assume the cavity coupled to the to the S1 to, to S0 to S1 surface, uh, S1 states. Uh, and we'll, what we do is to solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation for the entire system exactly. So uh, the, the, the four wave function is expanded in a, in a complete basis set. So, uh, so, of course, there's a huge parameter space one can explore for, for the carrier frequency and the coupling. Uh, so, I just here I just want to mention a particular uh, regime where we find uh, very interesting. So, uh, basically, uh, here, the, uh, the cavity frequency is in resonance, uh, is well, close to resonance with the transition frequency at the conical intersection. Okay, so it's, it's not at the Frank condom point, but at the conical intersection point. So, uh, and, uh, uh, so this summarizes the left two figures, summarize the dynamics uh, of, of the parallel dynamics and the uh, pristine dynamics. So basically, uh, without the cavity, we, we see that there's a, uh, about uh, there's a relaxation to the S1 state in about uh, 40 frames per second. Uh, so this is really ultra fast process. Uh, and then there's no, uh, ground, there's no ground state population during this uh, process because uh, the ground state is detached from the, uh, the two uh, uh, excited state surfaces. But uh, we, uh, when we turn on the coupling, uh, then we see, a, a, a first of all, there's see a suppression of, of the population transfer to the S1 state, and then we see a, uh, we see a, a huge rise of a population in the ground state. So, uh, so how do we understood? How do we understand this uh, this parallel dynamics? Uh, so, uh, so we would like to have a simple picture of what is going on. So, uh, so there is, has been a, 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 pic, a, a extension of the original born Oppenheimer approximation uh, uh, to to understand parallel dynamics. So the idea is that, uh, so original Brown-Oppenheimer approximation is, is to separate the motion of electrons and nuclei uh, because electrons move uh, typically faster than the, than the nuclear motion. Uh, but here we have uh, the extra degrees of freedom that the electrons get a friend, uh, which is a photon. So, uh, but since we are interested in the electronic coupling stream, so it's photon, uh, we can imagine photon moves in the same time scale as the electrons. So uh, basically we can group electrons and photons together and uh, still apply the adiabatic approach uh, like Borne-Hammer well, approximation. So uh, in the end, we have this paratonic Hamiltonian that has a parametric dependence on the nuclear configuration. Uh, this, so this is basically the original Borne-Hammer Hamiltonian uh, plus the cavity and plus uh, the uh, molecular cavity coupling that also parametric depends on uh, the nuclear configuration. And then the nuclear dynamics can be interpreted in terms of uh, using these surfaces. So uh, essentially what we are doing is that we fix one coordinate and then we diagonalize the polyton in Hamiltonian by getting, obtaining those polyton space and then we connect all those uh, points and we get uh, these polyton surfaces and then the nuclear wave packet moves on these surfaces. So essentially in this picture, the cavity effects is, is how it influences the position in the surfaces. So uh, to see how the uh, pariton surfaces looks like for this purity molecule. Uh, so this is a cut uh, that I find easiest, that is most convenient to interpret the dynamics. So this is along uh, the two, one of the modes of the molecule. And, and then this, this uh, purple curve is the original S2 and S1 state. And then this, uh, and this uh, 
this pure photon state is a replica of, of the ground state and the, uh, the uh, upshifted one photon energy. Uh, so this is a zero coupling case. Uh, then we, when we turn on the coupling, uh, uh, what happens is that the original coordinate section in the adiabatic surfaces uh, has, uh, has disappeared, uh, but instead we can create uh, two new coordinate sections that is between parietal states. So we can we will call this a parietal uh, coordinate intersection. Uh, so this parietal states is a linear uh, superposition of, of the molecule in the S1 state, uh, stereo state, uh, and there's a excitation in the cavity, and then the molecule in the S1 state, and there's uh, no excitation in the cavity. And uh, so then the, uh, okay, so the position of this uh, parietonic coordinate intersection uh, actually can be tuned by when, uh, if we change the coupling strengths, uh, so uh, and this is a 3D view of this uh, pair of coordinate intersection that is pretty clear in, in this 3D figure. So now uh, if we understand the dynamics, we try, try to understand the dynamics in terms of these surfaces. So uh, first of all, we still have this uh, photo excitation from the ground state to the S2 surface. Uh, and this process is not modified by the cavity because the cavity is, is detuned from the uh, from the vertical transition uh, region. Uh, but then it starts to move, and uh, before it hits the original coordinate section, which is about here, uh, it will hit this parietonic coordinate intersection uh, very fast. So if this is basically saying that the relaxation will happen much faster. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the coordinate section will mediate the transition to the uh, upper parieton surface, and then what we see is that the wave packet starts to move in the upper parieton uh, surfaces. So, uh, uh, so, okay, so, and this explains, first of all, why we see a uh, faster relaxation uh, uh, it, when we have this strong coupling, and then also when, why we have this uh, rise of the uh, ground state population, because this parietal surface contains part of uh, the, the S0 and one uh, photon in cavity uh, state. So we will have, we will see a population in the, in the S0 state. And this is a, uh, 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 how the wave packet comparing to the uh, for the bare dynamics and the cavity dynamics. Uh, so as, as you see that, as we see here that the, uh, that the, uh, in the cavity case, the, the, the distribution of the nuclear uh, configuration is much narrow. Uh, that's uh, as we expect because the, the uh, energy is partially contained in the, in the, in the, in the cavity mode now. Okay, so, uh, so we can also couple, uh, so one thing we have not considered is the external uh, decoherence uh, that basically our, our, uh, we have not considered the effects of a bass uh, that would, if the reaction happens in a condensed phase, so we typically have an external environment that can introduce uh, electronic decoherence to the electronic uh, superpositions in the molecule. So other than the, so other than the, uh, the vibrational mode that has already been included uh, in, the, in the model. So, uh, so for this, we can include a, a harmonic a bath, uh, which consists of, of a continuum of harmonic modes and they're coupled to the full parieton system. Uh, and this, uh, this whole set of a system can be solved by uh, coupling the time dimensional equation to a method called a hierarchical equation of motion. So, uh, but the important message here is that uh, even with, uh, so this lambda is basically the, uh, the, the quantity that characterizes how strong the uh, system bath coupling is. So basically, uh, with the G equal to 100, uh, 120 milli electron volts, and this is 240, we are, we are sort of in the weak coupling region now, uh, but uh, uh, we still see that the cavity control is pretty robust to the decoherence, uh, at least for this uh, regime that I was showing here. And uh, uh, for certain, so the, uh, in this case, there are some oscillations in the population gets uh, destroyed by the, by the environment. But overall, the, the cavity effects is, is still there. So the, the gray curve is the original uh, without cavity dynamics, and, and the others are, are with cavities. Okay, so uh, uh, I think uh, I think I will. Okay, maybe I will skip this part first, and then uh, uh, if I have time, I can come back to to the uh, to the transient absorption about. Uh, actually, the absorption spectrum of the parieton uh, dynamics. So, uh, I would like to talk about how can, uh, is this scheme uh, doable with many molecules? Uh, because right now, we, uh, so far, we have been talking about a single molecule in the strong coupling regime. 
So the uh, immediate question is, uh, if we have many molecules and uh, each molecule is in the, uh, is, has a weak coupling, but uh, overall we have this uh, so-called collective strong coupling regime. Uh, so is this, uh, can we able, still able to see uh, the Pareto effects here? So uh, of course, we, with this exact quantum dynamics approach, we cannot go too, uh, too far with, with many molecules, but we can uh, sort of gain some insight, useful insights, uh, by comparing a single molecule with two molecules, and we still consider this regime where the uh, cavity is in resonance with the quantum intersection point. Uh, so again, we solve the uh, time differential equation for the full system that contains two molecules and cavity and all the couplings uh, together, and we basically see, uh, so it requires about four million basis functions to convert the dynamics. Okay, so, uh, so this summarizes the dynamics, a comparison of, of a single molecule and two molecule dynamics. So I uh, just want to point out two, so two important things uh, that uh, is introduced by the extra molecule is that there's a, a enhanced effective coupling that we know that square uh, proportional to the square root of two. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this enhanced coupling does not come uh, uh, with uh, free. It comes with a price that we have to pay is the, uh, the uh, the collective dark states in, in the surfaces. So, uh, so uh, basically, uh, the fact that the, there's a difference between a single molecule and two molecules with the same coupling, it shows that the, this effective, uh, the enhanced effective coupling plays an important role in the dynamics. Uh, but on the other hand, that the, with a single molecule with a stronger coupling, uh, we still see a huge difference here that basically tells us the, the, the importance of this uh, effective dark states. So uh, to see how this uh, the basic level scheme uh, shows up in the molecule, uh, we can sort of have a, a simplified view of the levels. So if we imagine each molecule is a three-level system, that's zero, S1, S2, uh, and then with two molecules, we can form this delocalized exciton states as a superposition of the original states. And then we have this bright plus states that uh, couple to the cavity, and then we have this uh, basic structure of, of the proton states. Uh, then we have this upper and lower proton state uh, which contain a dark state in the middle, and then we have this uh, bright and the dark the delocalized exciton states. So uh, of course these were translated into surfaces in the molecule, but we all we uh, we can see the basic structure here. So there, this is a twofold degenerate state, which is, comes from two plus and two minus, and then we have this upper proton and one minus dark exciton state, and then this lower proton. So uh, the initial, excit initial excitation goes, for two molecule case, goes to the two plus uh, bright exciton state. Uh, basically, it's, there's one excitation in, shared by uh, the two molecules, and then it starts to move on these collective surfaces. Okay, but while it moves, there is a uh, there's a relaxation already to the dark to the dark uh, two minus state already, as we can see from this dark state population that there's an initial uh, rapid rise of dark state population uh, about uh, ten femtosecond. per second. So, uh, and this uh, this of course com uh, comes from the vibronic couplings in the in the system. And now, uh, what happens? Is, uh, so we have two wave packets now. One is in the bright exciton state, and this one uh, is in the dark exciton state. Now, the part in the bright exciton state, uh, and we'll, move, we'll encounter this uh, protonic quantum intersection and move in the upper proton surface. Uh, that's essentially where we see this proton effects. Uh, but this dark wave packet will keep will keep moving until it hits this dark state quantum intersection. And uh, th this dark state quantum intersection is very similar to the original uh, quantum intersection. So, uh, and then it will move in the dark states. Uh, so this picture is uh, sort of confirmed by, I uh, see a rapid, uh, uh, rapid decay of this population of, of the two uh, minus state. Okay, so that's a basic picture of uh, what we learned from the uh, two molecule simulations. So I think the important thing is that there's a competition between uh, uh, the uh, bright surface and the dark surface uh, but for this particular molecule, because the uh, quantum section is very close to the uh, frank quantum point, so uh, it takes about uh, 20 femtosecond for, for this internal conversion to occur. So, uh, so our, our uh, feeling is that uh, even we have more uh, molecules and we have more uh, uh, dark states. Uh, so un unless all the dark states relax in, in this 20 femtosecond, uh, otherwise we should be able to observe this, uh, this uh, passage through the protonic quantum intersection and to and see the manipulation of, of the cavity effect. So uh, 
So, so how many minutes do I? You have like about uh, like five or ten more minutes. I was a little quick with the introduction, so you have a okay. couple extra minutes to go ahead. Okay, then I just go back to to the uh, to the trend in absorption uh, with the uh, pariton dynamics. So uh, we try to see what uh, what is the signature of this pariton uh, of this pariton dynamics in the trend in absorption spectrum. So uh, this technique has been carried out by uh, by by Wei group uh, and by by Shaw's group more recently. So uh, basically. Uh, basically, uh, we have two pulses, and the pump pulse uh, excites the sample, and then after variable time delay, uh, the probe pulse uh, interrogates the system to see what is the uh, change in the, and we detect the probe pulse to see what is the change in the, in the transmission of the probe pulse. So uh, the, the, uh, for the um, Christian molecule, what happens is the pump pulse excites to the S2 state, and then uh, initiating the photochemistry, and then after certain time delay, we will have the uh, the probe pulse coming, and then the probe pulse can do uh, either can do excited state absorption, uh, excited system to higher excited, to higher excited state, or uh, do a stimulated emission uh, goes back to the ground state, uh, taking the system uh, to the ground state. Uh, and this is what we see in in the in the Chandrian absorption. So we have this uh, big stimulated emission peak at the uh, this is close to the original uh, vertical transition energy, and then it starts to uh, uh, shift uh, to the lower energy that corresponding to the wave packing motion. Uh, but uh, then, uh, so these are the uh, general absorption for the prioriton dynamics. So we don't see uh, it's excited absorption here because we don't have uh, higher excited states in our model. Uh, but uh, for the uh, prioriton dynamics, uh, so we see similar dynamics uh, up to 10 frames per second. This is the stimulated emission peak uh, with, with the red shift. Uh, uh, but uh, after the, after the uh, relaxation to the upper pariton surface, uh, we see this uh, adop, sort of a doublet of, of the excited absorption feature in the, uh, in the, in the pariton dynamics. And uh, this has to, uh, comes, uh, this comes from the uh, excited absorption from the, uh, the wave packet that has been uh, transit, that, that uh, sits on the upper pariton surface to the, to the even higher, uh, or we call the two pariton states. Uh, so, uh, because these two pariton states in the single molecule case is, is not coupled to the pure molecular state, uh, molecular surface. So the, we can only see the excited, excited state absorption signal when the wave packet uh, hits the pariton conic intersection and goes to the upper pariton surface. So that is sort of a clear signature of, of this pariton effects uh, in, the, in the transient absorption. Okay, so with that, I think uh, I can just conclude that uh, we have shown that uh, uh, the passage through a conical intersection uh, dynamics can be uh, manipulated by, uh, by putting a cavity there, uh, and particularly when the cavity is in resonance with the transition frequency at the conical intersection, we see a, we'll see a splitting of the pristine conical intersection. Uh, and then we, we showed that uh, we can uh, observe this pariton dynamics through transient absorption signal. Uh, and, in, and when we have more molecules, we see a computation uh, between the pariton effect and this uh, and relaxation to the dark state. And I, so, uh, so whether we were uh, ultimately see pariton effects will determine how, much, uh, how fast the dark state relaxation uh, happens. So uh, with that, uh, uh, let me thank you, uh, uh, my group. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, with that, let me thank my uh, group members. Uh, uh, especially uh, Stefano, uh, that has been uh, helped me a lot. Uh, with diff uh, we have, have every day uh, useful discussions every day. Uh, and then uh, uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Let me go. All right. All right. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Dr. Bingu. Uh, just keep sharing your screen. We can't see your slides right now, but uh, keep your, uh, your slides up so we can uh, okay. refer okay. back to them with any questions. Okay. Um, we actually have a question through the Q&A um, option from Blake Simpkins. Um, he says, hi, I believe you model coupling between the cavity and a dark exciton state. It seems this dark exciton would not couple to the cavity since it's dark. Would it be more relevant to experiments to have coupling to the upper bright exciton instead? Would the conclusions be the same? So, uh, so can I see the question in the Q&A? Yeah, Q&A. 
So, uh, so one thing is that this dark exciton state is not really, is not completely dark if we go to other region of the, of the collective surfaces. So is this, okay, so yeah, so this is for the, uh, so two molecule case, right? Uh, so, so it's only dark when uh, in the particular cut I showed. So uh, I, I assume it also uh, couples to, to the bright dark exciton state in, in the other region of the, uh, you know, when there's a full uh, configuration space of the molecule, uh, would it be more relevant to experiment to have coupling to the upper right exciton state? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I understand. I mean, the initial excitation is to the upper uh, bright exciton, uh, and then uh, we see the, the dynamics happening. So uh, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Um, and then we have a few um, raise hand questions. So go ahead, Hoel. Hi, Bing. Uh, I have a question about your statement that because the conical intersection is very close to the Frank Condon uh, region, you get this really fast decay to the dark state. So are you able to move your potential energy surfaces around such that the conical intersection is, say, much farther away from the Frank Condon region and therefore suppress this ultra fast relaxation while still maintaining strong light matter coupling? Uh, of course, we, yeah, we can do that, uh, but we, we haven't done that uh, because the model is fixed uh, for, for the periods in case. So are you claiming that you can really suppress this uh, very fast relaxation to the dark states despite there being many in the collective regime? Uh, I, okay, I, I think based on the simulation with the two molecules, uh, the, this paratonic conical intersection is even closer to the, to the Frank Condon point uh, because okay, there's a pair of paratonic conical intersection and one is further away from the Frank Condon regime and one mm -hmm. is closer to it. And, and, and we, that's why we see a much faster relaxation when we have this strong coupling uh, effect. So well, I, I guess, I, I guess there, there could be a situation where if the light matter coupling is very large, then the, the two conical intersections are very far away from the Frank Condon region, in which case you get some sort of blockade, right? Like to the dark states. I'm not sure though. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, if it completely relaxes before it hits the paratonic conical intersection, then uh, I expect we don't really see any parieton effects uh, when, when we have many molecules. Okay, thank you very much. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, and then we have another question from Luis. Go ahead, Luis. Oh, hi, Bing. Hey, um, Luis. Uh, yeah, so my question is regarding your transient absorption spectra. I noticed yeah. uh, um, that a, a, a around three Bs or something like that. Uh, there is like, an, yeah, if you, at, at intermediate Gs, you have a negative signal like around three EVs. Yeah. But when you increase the, the light matter coupling, right? You, you get, you go from negative to positive. Uh, could you elaborate on the origin of this behavior? Uh, you mean this peak at, yeah. at, at uh, 30 femtosecond? per second? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, the, okay, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about that particular peak uh, in the spectrum, but, but I think only the only uh, low frequency stimulated emission that can happen is from this uh, up, uh, lower proton to the ground state. Yeah. So, uh, so it, it could be that a certain uh, coupling that the, this lower, uh, this, uh, lower proton population uh, is, is also changed when we, we change the coupling strength uh, but uh, but I don't have a clear answer to this question. Uh, I, I can yeah, check we, the uh, lower proton population. 
Okay, yeah, we can talk later about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so that will conclude our Q&A session for this talk. Um, if you could please, Dr. Bengook, if you could um, uh, stop, stop sharing. sharing. Yeah. yeah, thanks. All right, thank you once again. Um, and then let me introduce our next speaker. Um, okay, so our, our second speaker today is Dr. Christian Honor Dottir. Um, Dr. Arno Dottir received her BS from the Science Institute of the University of Iceland. She then received her master's from the Stockholm University and then received her PhD from the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Um, under the supervision of Professor Ivan uh, Schilling. Today, she is a postdoc in the Keeling Group at the University of St. Andrews. Um, and with that, um, Dr. Honor Dottir, the screen is yours. Thank you. Um, okay, everyone can see, see my screen, I guess. Um, yeah, thank you for having me here and thank you in advance for listening. Um, as Kai said, my name is Kristin Björk Arndotter and I'm a postdoc um, in the University of St. Andrews. And today I want to talk to you about uh, multimode organic polariton lacing, which is um, a project that I did under the supervision of Jonathan Keeling and with um, and in collaboration with these lovely people here. Uh, I will want to start with a little bit of motivation, like what kind of questions were we um, thinking about when we went into the direction that we did. Um, the first thing I will mention is uh, thermalization. So when we're looking at a polariton system, organic polariton system, there is always the question of is this thermalized or is it not? Is it lacing or condensation or what? But if we want to have a model that fully captures this, we need to have the multiple photon modes because the thermalization is a statistical effect that is talking about how the occupation uh, as a function of energy uh, depends on the temperature. Um, another thing that experiments, experiments have shown uh, is that in some molecules we can see lacing at a finite k, so a non-zero k lacing, and sometimes even switching between lacing at the finite k and lacing at k equal to zero, depending on parameters such as temperature or, or pumping strength. And to understand that this, we naturally will need a model that has multiple photon modes. Um, the third thing that we are kind of interested in studying or looking at is um, the blue shift of the condensate. Uh, the lower polariton branch uh, or condensates in that. Um, that is not as straightforward to to connect that to the, the multiple, uh, having multiple photon modes in that, but I will have a bit of a connection to that later. And, and the approach that we use here is is good at looking at this because what we need to be able to look at the blue shift is to extract the actual energies of the system instead of just looking at the bare frequencies of the um, of the photon modes or the exome that goes into it. So um, if we move aside and look at what I have actually done. So uh, the outline of this talk is that first I will explain to you a little bit the system and the model that I've been using, which is the I've been using the Tavis coming Holstein Hamiltonian with multiple photon modes, which I will explain to you what it means. Um, I will then go on, uh, say a few words about the methods that I use and why I chose them and, and, and what we get from that. And uh, in particular, I will talk about using the cumulant expansion to go uh, beyond mean field theory um, as a systematic ex expansion. And secondly, I will talk about using the generalized Gell-Mann matrices as um, a basis for a more holistic operator for the molecules where we where the electronic and vibrational states are uh, kind of taken together. And after that, I will uh, go to my results. First, talking about steady state results, um, mostly the uh, number of photons in different modes and, and how that uh, changes with different parameters. And lastly, I will talk about how we can calculate the photoluminescence spectra with what we have and uh, show you some examples and, and what information we can 
uh, extract from those. So to start with, I'm looking at organic molecules in a planar microcavity. Um, and as I said, the, ca the cavity um, uh, can support multiple photon modes like most planar microcavity can do. Um, when I say molecule, I have a very simple idea as a physicist. I know there are many chemists in the audience. Um, I just see a molecule as a, a two-level uh, system in an electronic sense and then harmonic oscillator to account for a single uh, phonon mode or vibrational mode. And then the coupling between the vibration and the electronic excitation comes from this displacement uh, of the harmonic oscillator, meaning that the vibrational configuration is not the same in the ground than the excited set. Um, I then take into account some incoherent processes, which is an incoherent pump of the electronic state, uh, non radiative losses of the electronic state, and the defacing of the two level system. And then I also have thermal excitation and relaxation of the uh, vibrations or phonons. And as I said, the, um, the cavity has um, almost a continuum of, of modes, we could say. There's always some finite size of facts, which means that the, they will be quantized, but we will have many relevant photon modes in general, uh, in many cases, in, in these kind of cavities. So if we look here at the bare photon frequency, so this would be what are the photon modes of an empty cavity. And if we put that in resonance with the energy of the two-level system, um, and we turn on the coupling between these two terms, we end up with uh, the familiar upper lower polariton branch. And this is in the case of, of neglecting the, the vibrational uh, side bands and that just for simplicity. Um, and we can see when we look at these kind of um, uh, dispersions, we can see that there are many photon modes, many wave vectors that are interacting with the molecules that might be having an effect uh, uh, might be having an effect on the system. So we need to account for all of these. But for high wave vectors, we will get that the upper and lower polariton branch are asymptotically going towards the bare photon and bare exciton energies. And the mixed nature of the polariton that we have close to the crossing uh, kind of goes away. We end up just with a bare photon and bare exciton. So those photon modes become um, irrelevant. So the excitons in that area is the, the dark states that is often talked about and the um, bare photon modes as i say don't add much to the system so what we we introduce um something that we have called omega max which is uh, the highest energy um the highest energy of the photon that we take into account and that then sets some finite number of photon modes that we are looking at and and coupling to uh, some number of molecules. So this is kind of a, the pictorial or, or um, cartoon version of the model. And if I show you what the mathematics looks like, the um, Hamiltonian is, as I say, a two-level system, which is just a, a Pauli operator. And then we, we sum over however many molecules we have. The vibrational coupling is, we, I take into account only one mode, on each molecule, and then there is this displacement term here that uh, makes sure that the the uh, the parabolas are shifted in the the x quadrature space. I then add the pho photon modes, and as I say, multiple photon modes, which is just summing over harmonic oscillator terms, and then the coupling between the two is uh, through a used rotating wave approximation. So we just have the term of the sigma plus and, and um, AK, so increasing electronic excitation on one molecule and decreasing the number of photons in one of the modes and then vice versa, summing over all um, wave vectors and, and molecules. Then the incoherent processes I take into account by using the Lindblad master equation. And here are the terms that I have explained to you before. Um, so the methods that I use, uh, 
before I decide the method, I guess I, I should uh, go back to what kind of questions do I want to answer. And the main question I want to answer is I want to be able to monitor how many photons there are in the different photon modes. And the kind of straightforward thing to do is using mean field theory, so taking the um, taking the equation, uh, taking the master equation that I wrote before and calculating the expectation value of the different operators. And mean, in mean field theory, it means that any time I have an expectation value in my equation that takes uh, two or more operators, I split them apart, saying I only really care about the amplitude and phase of each of these uh, operators by themselves. And this is not good enough in our case because what happens is that the corrections to mean field uh, go like the number of photon modes over the number of molecules that I have. And in the single mode case, you, we have just one over number of molecules and we, it's easy to kind of think, yeah, we have a big system, this becomes very small, it doesn't matter. But in our case, the number of photon modes will grow when we take a big, bigger system. And generally this is going to be a finite parameter. We have to go, um, uh, this ratio will go like the, uh, this ratio here, which is, so this is the effective photon mass, the confined photon mass, the splitting, uh, the Rabi splitting, and the density of emitters in a, the 2D plane. And we can see, so, if I have zero, if I want this to go down, I can take zero photon mass, which is not confining my photon. Um, the Rabi splitting is normally something that is fixed. And then the, the density, taking an infinite density doesn't make as much sense as just taking a, a large system. So this is generally going to be a finite thing. So we would like to be more exact than just throwing away the correlations here. Um, and another reason to go beyond mean field there are a couple of other things is one uh, mean field theory throws away like thermalization or quantum fluctuations so if we want to be able to look at uh, small occupations in the photon modes we need to go beyond mean field and secondly um, that if i want to calculate the photoluminescence spectra i will need the second order correlators meaning things that look like this so which are, i'm kind of throwing away in the mean field theory. So what we do is take a systematic expansion that is based on uh, cumulant expansion. Um, what are cumulants? So a cumulant average is kind of the, the correlations between um, the uh, operators that you have that cannot be written as a combination of lower order correlations. So, and if, um, if you've used Feynman diagrams before, this is analog analogous to uh, connected diagrams. So it's um, effects that cannot be uh, taken, like that you cannot easily simplify by just um, adding up the, the lower order terms. And you can see that the, the first, um, the from the first term, that putting the second order cumulant to zero gives us the mean field. Um, gives us mean field theory. So what we do is just, we, we take it one step further, we keep the correlations between uh, uh, sets of two operators, but we throw away the correlations between three operators at the same time. We say that the correlations between any three operators can be written as a combination of the correlations between the pairs. And so this um, lets us keep the quantum fluctuations, and this means that we will end up with second order correlators that are um, that we can then use to uh, calculate the photoluminescence spectra. Um, yes, and then the question is, okay, so um, we have that the exciton or the two-level system is coupling both to these vibrational modes and the photon modes, and it's kind of difficult to look at them both at the same time. So what we have done is um, looking at the the molecule as, as a single thing that is then, then uh, uh, coupling to the photon modes. So as I said before, we have the molecule, we look at it as a two-level system plus a harmonic oscillator. And now I'm saying instead of, um, instead of looking at it like this, I truncate 
my harmonic oscillator. So I say, okay, instead of harmonic oscillator, it is an equidistant n-level system. And then I take the two-level system and n-level system together and make a two n-level system where I will have half of them are electronic ground states and a different number of, of pho uh, phonons and then the uh, excited state and similar. And um, so I have that these operators here now are of a higher dimension and we use the generalized Gelman matrices as a basis for this because it gives us a straightforward way of writing uh, tensors here, AI and BI, in a way that this becomes the Hamiltonian. So we hear some sum over uh, tensor indices is uh, suppressed. And, and this also has uh, another good thing is that the generalized Gelman matrices, which are kind of a generalization of the Pauli matrices to higher dimensions, um, that they let us that any time we have two operators on the same molecule, they can be written as a linear combination of um, single operators, which helps us that if we're just keeping the, the second order terms, it means that we can keep every, every molecular operator on a single molecule uh, connected to others. So to show you what I mean, I'll say that you can use the master equation that I showed you before and this Hamiltonian here to write down the equations of motions for all operators up to a second term, to second term. But because we have some symmetries of the Hamiltonian, and if we assume that we have many molecules that are homogeneously spread, we end up being able to write uh, just these uh, terms here, which is the expectation of single molecular operators that do not uh, change the electronic excitation of the system. So it is uh, corresponding to the sigma z Pauli matrices, the number of uh, photons in each mode, the correlations between um, deleting one photon and um, making one excitation on a molecule, or vice versa with the complex conjugates, or the and the correlations between different molecules. So taking away a, an excitation on one molecule and adding it to another. Um, yeah, so we can write down the equations of motions for this, solve them and uh, find a steady state. If I go then to my results for that, first I'll show you here, this is the kind of phase diagram which tells us are we lacing or not. This is showing the total photon occupation for different uh, positions of the lowest um, photon uh, mode. And it, so detuning of the dispersion and the uh, pump compared to uh, the non-radiative losses for two different values of the rabbi splitting. And so the first case, we are somewhat in the strong coupling regime. There is strong coupling between the photon and the zero phonon line. So the, the transition that does not affect the number of, of photons. But the when we go into the side bands, which is increasing, uh, well, increasing the number of photons when you go down from excited state, we are outside of the strong coupling regime. So we, um, yeah, so we get basically photon lacing here. I forgot to mention that the white line here is the result from a mean field single mode approach that was um, done earlier by a um, collaborator. Um, and we see that it, it matches quite well. Um, but the mean field was able to tell us either just like there is lacing or not, or not. So it's just a clear line, but while we have a more of a gradient, but it is clear that the line is a similar place. The right hand side, we will have um, things are a bit shifted because we have quite strong coupling here. And um, I'll point out that you can see here, there's a, a bit of a uh, deviation from the single mode case. And that is because in the single mode case where we are very negatively detuned, we are getting out of resonant with the, the transitions of the sidebands. So there will be no, it will be harder to lace. So the, the threshold goes up. But in our case, we will have, um, we will still have uh, finite K, uh, K modes that uh, are in resonance, are in resonance with some of the transitions. And so we can still have lacing. And that kind of brings us into the question of 
this tells us whether there is lacing or not, but um, the information that we get from what we have is that we can count the numbers in each of the modes. So now I'll show you which of the modes, like in the lacing regions, which is the mode that has the highest occupation. Um, and I don't think I'll go into too many details. I could talk quite long about all of these figures, but I think I'll just give you a little bit of an overview. Of, but the interesting thing is that we see this kind of uh, spike come up in between the first and second sideband. So I forgot to say that 0.2 is the uh, frequency of the vibrations, meaning that here we have the one phonon transition and here we have the two phonon transition. And here we, we see that for low pumping, the lacing stays resonant with the one phonon transition until we pump hard enough and then we go than it is uh, in between the two modes. So it, it's being affected by the transition, the lower transition of the two phonon transition. Um, to show you a little bit more what is going on here, I'll show you the, for a few value, different values of pump and a few different values, uh, for one value of the tuning for each of these and a few different value of pump, what is the occupation of all of the modes? or well, all of the, the most relevant modes, kind of. We can see in the, um, and this is taken on a line here in between, so the detuning of point three. Well, and here we see that on lower, first there's no lacing, then lacing at the finite K, and then we go to uh, lacing at zero. You can see the yellow line, there's no lacing. And I'll point out that it is because we're going beyond mean field theory that we can see these uh, small, small number of occupations in mean field, this would be exactly zero. But first we have no lacing, pump a bit harder, we have lacing uh, close to 0.8. Um, then we have, for a very narrow range of parameters, we have lacing at both points, and then the lacing at 0.8 is suppressed, so we have only lacing at k equal to zero. But for the stronger coupled case, we have something different that we have, this kind of lacing seems to be moving in in a way and I guess I'll here point out that the frequencies here like this is the bare photon frequencies these are not the free actual frequencies of the system which we will need to calculate the, the photoluminescence spectrum for so um, another quick image to show that this is a uh, kind of similar information that as we had before so if I take just the occupation of the the modes that have macroscopic occupation at any point and plot them as a function of, of pump, we can see here that um, in the lower um, coupled case that there is, basically we see that there are two modes that, that switch quite straightforwardly, um, going from basically zero and then linearly going upwards is kind of just a semi-classical picture of uh, what happens in a laser we can see that we have, okay, a normal laser and then another normal laser that are kind of like in a mosaic kind of put together. And we can see if we, we do a linear fit to, to this part here that we that the thresholds of the two are a bit different and the slope of the two are a bit different. So they, there's different slope efficiency, different thresholds, and they are competing with each other. Um, but in the, the stronger coupling case, things are not linear, not kind of as straightforward to see that we have kind of going back and forth between uh, a few different modes. So um, to understand better what's going on, we might want to see, okay, what are the actual frequencies that are uh, lacing? And to do that, as I said, I need to go to the photoluminescence spectra. So this is the, what we need to calculate for the spectra, that we need to take the two-time correlator and then Fourier transform it. The two-time correlator um, in the steady state, so if you assume a steady state, we have calculated the steady state, we can uh, straightforward to calculate what the two-time correlator is using the quantum regression theorem. And then we can get the spectra, which will give us what are the actual frequencies um, of the system. So if I show you some example of photoluminous spectra, so both of these are for the stronger coupled case because that is kind of more interesting. Um, and this kind of captured everything I, I want to show you. So these are for two different uh, pump strengths. The detuning, so the bare photon frequency is 0.7. 
Um, and you can see here that the uh, yeah the splitting is like the 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 Rabi splitting is, is um, quite obvious that we are obviously considerably lower than uh, 0.7, and we can see here beautifully the lower polariton branch and the upper polariton branch. Um, but then when we increase the pumping, we get so one thing that we will see if I would take a, a like plot a, a snapshot of this is that you can see clearly the 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 line narrowing, and so we have lacing here in this mode, so it's not all that clear that this is the brightest, but then this is a logarithmic scale. But uh, so we have, we can see the lacing there, we can see the line narrowing, but more importantly, we can see here that the there has been a blue shift of the lower polariton branch. So this is something that we can extract. We can see that yeah, by pumping harder, we um, are shifting the lower polariton branch up. And if I plot, so what is the position of this branch at the k equal to zero as a function of pump? I get this curve here where we, for very low pump, I, I have uh, about 0.45. It grows with pump. And then here is the lacing threshold. It goes in a little bit, um, little bit shallower. And then it kind of saturates when we have a very strong pump. And so this is coming from the the saturation of the two level system the more you pump the more occupation you will have in the in the excited state or less excitation you will have in the ground state which makes it um kind of harder makes the coupling weaker because you will have fewer electrons or fewer uh two level systems to kind of couple to the to like absorb the light and to show you that this is what is going on i, I plot here the expectation value of the sigma set operator um, for the same pumps. And you can say, see that they basically overlay each other. So this kind of is telling us the, the occupation of the ground states and how the, the effective Rabi splitting is, is going to be, um, effective Rabi splitting is uh, going to be proportional to the occupation of the ground states because of this. So we can see that, um, yeah, so this has been something that I've talked to people at conferences and see people mention that. Um, and this is something we can extract from our model. So if I just quickly thank my collaborator, so Jonathan Keeling, for um, my boss for this. And we were happy to collaborate with uh, Pivot Herma and Antti Malenin in Aslo University. And then uh, Artem Strasko, which is now at Flatiron Institute and is a former PhD student of, of uh, John Van Keeling, also contributed to this and my funding. And then I'll, I'll throw up my conclusion slide. Um, and I'll mention that, so this work has is a, in a preprint that is on the archives if anyone is interested, but I'm well, open for questions. All right, well, thank you, um, Dr. Arnold Otero. Um, yeah, so we definitely have some questions here. Uh, go ahead, Sandana. Hi. Um, so I have a question related to the strong coupling regime. So as you mm -hmm. increase uh, the pumping, you said first you lace at larger K values, right? And then uh, beyond a certain, uh, uh, as you increase pumping even more, then you start lacing at the K equals zero. Um, I'm curious whether the first starting point of the uh, uh, of the lacing is that mm -hmm. at the anti-crossing? Um, so the lowest, I mean, the largest value of k at which lacing yeah. happens. So, so in in this case here, we will have the the anti-crossing. If I have. So it is actually at the crossing of the uh, first sideband. So actually what I, the picture that I had here is like too simple. There should be more lines here to kind of, uh, um, to denote the sideband. So the, the transition that is going from here, the ground state here and to the, the first excited phonome state here kind of. Um, so it is basically at the the crossing of the first sideband, so the first transition that is not 
the zero phone on one that is not the typical one and um and the the photon okay so the first a value is basically of the uh, basically of the first sideband the okay. yes yeah yeah okay. yeah thank you all right and then go ahead matt hi uh I have a question about uh, the role of uh, dark states uh, in the both the lasing and the supposed luminescence. Because I notice it seems like at the region of anti-crossing there is some photoluminescence. Um, yeah. So in this kind of model, the dark states are kind of the ones that I will not have plotted here um, because I will have very many molecules. So in these calculations, I have 10 to the eight molecules, I think, and like less than 100 photon modes. So I can plot a picture like this for all the photon modes that I have, like up to the K of the maximum photon modes that I have. But those will always just show me the kind of the, the photon component of the polariton that I, I will show, but there will always be, so there's going to be the number of molecules minus the number of photon modes that I have, which are then um, exciton modes or like modes, like molecular modes, like a linear combination of the molecules that do not have any fo uh, photon component. So that is going to be my dark states. But I was just wondering, but, yeah, yeah, exactly. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so, I, but I guess, so, like, I could technically make, like, take this K larger, and I would see that this, so if you see, there's, like, a faint line here, and this will become, like, darker and darker and darker, and then you could say, okay, that wh what I'm actually plotting is then the photon component of the state that has almost no exciton component, but then, and, but, and then I will have a, a peak at the bare photon frequency, but if I would look at it from the other way, so the spectra from the point of view of the molecule, then I would have the opposite, that I will have a state that is just uh, almost untouched, uh, like so a dark state that is uh, the, the uh, yes, the, uh, have I answered your question? Uh, more specifically, I was wondering about the role of dark states in you know, being an energy sink or relaxation for the different polar mm. states. I was wondering how the, diff the relaxation to dark states, since you have, you know, vibronic coupling and many dark states, right? Uh, I, was, I, I imagine um, relaxation and dark states would play a significant role in the spectrum, photoluminescent spectrum as well as lasing, right? Yeah, so I have not, I don't have like ex explicitly, I don't have included uh, relaxation towards the dark states. But there will be some occupation of the dark state as kind of there is occupation of all of the molecules. And if we look at the, the basis of like a linear combination of all of the molecules, some of those will couple to light and some not. And the ones that don't are the dark states. So they will be an energy sink. That is true. Um, but I don't have explicitly um, decay into the dark states. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, and then we also have a question through the Q&A option. Um, do you see that on your screen? Um, I guess I yeah. need to. Oh, I saw it earlier. Okay. If not, I can. Oh, I can no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I found it. Uh, photoluminescence PL has not been experimentally observed from the upper polariton mode. Um, so I guess, um, I guess this is a question on, or if I finish for people that haven't read it. So the, the question is that ex there hasn't been experimentally observed the, um, photoluminescence from the upper polarton branch. And if, if my calculation proposed that we should be able to see it, I guess the, the, there are kind of two parts of the, this answer. One of them is that this is a logarithmic scale. So we definitely would have more occupation here in the lower polarton branch than the upper one here. 
and it might seem a little bit exaggerated because basically all of the occupation in the high K modes will be in the, the photon part. And then secondly, I guess we haven't done that much experimentation with um, exact parameters. The parameters we're using was, were mo makes, uh, mostly picked because we were able to get um, an absorption and emission spectrum in a simple case that uh, fit the things that we have seen in experiments. So I, I don't have this plotted here, but we have, um, if I put very uh, low coupling to light, we get a, like a nice uh, peak and then the sidebands look reasonable. But it could always be that we don't have high enough, uh, that the, some of the uh, relaxation isn't high enough. And that is why we're seeing occupation of this kind of higher energy things. So yeah, I wouldn't, um, yeah, I, I'm not going to tell experimentalists that they're going to be seeing this before looking a little bit more into making sure that the parameters are more realistic. But as I say, I think there's also, um, I think that if I would, plot this on a linear scale, then this would just overpower everything and you wouldn't be able to see this. So I, I mostly have plotted in a, in a log scale to be able to see the structure better. Does that answer the question? Um, I, th I think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, okay, so with that, um, that's going to conclude oh, our Oh, okay. I, I think I couldn't find the raise hand button, but can I, can I ask a quick question? Uh, sure. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so just a quick question about the method. Uh, so, uh, I, I assume that you're looking at the stationary state of, of the equations of motion. Uh, what, what about the real, yes. real, real time dynamic? So, we actually, the, yeah, this method can also be used for real time dynamics. And, um, yeah, we, we are, working on that with also with the collaborators of looking better at uh, like a pump system. So a pump system and what are the dy dynamics after that, but we don't really have uh, results that, that are ready to show right now, but so, uh, hopefully soon. So. What, what's your feeling of, of, of this method of describing a real time dynamics? Um, I think it's quite, um, yeah, like quite good and can be quite powerful in many ways. Of course. So this is, um, yeah, this is going to be more because we are looking at very many molecules and so a simpler picture of every molecule than uh, what you were looking at where you have like things more exact but for fewer molecules and i think it's very interesting to kind of compare the, these two approaches okay. so is um, there, but is there a physical reason why there's no free body correlations uh so that justify your approach the approach of um Can probably. But I mean, essentially, the, yeah. the hierarchy can goes to uh, you know higher orders. Yeah, yeah. Like you could go to higher order, but it's like quite quickly the number of equations would uh, increase quite drastically. So, but yeah, like there is, like yeah, you can definitely do this taking the next order. But the thing though is like if if this approach isn't good. So then we're, we're taking the next order of this uh, parameter here. And if the, taking it to the second order isn't a good enough approximation, then I'm not sure if the third order would add that much. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So I think like taking it to the second order, we're already adding some new things like the quantum fluctuation, being able to do the photoluminescence spectra, while a third order would kind of drastically increase um, the work you needed to do. But it would give you a little, like just a small quantitative and probably quite small quantitative corrections. Yeah. Okay, and then we have one more question uh, from Noel. Hey, Christine, uh, I, I really enjoyed the talk. I want to ask you uh, a question. So first of all, um, the blue shift you, uh, you associated mostly to saturation of the two level electronic system. So I imagine that the upper polariton will also will go down in energy, right? Is that the yes, case? Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, so now the, the, the second question I want to ask is a question of condensation. So, um, I mean, you, you said you, you were going to look at the photon statistics and see if, 
I mean, in the okay, realistic yeah, so... parameters that people utilize in these cavities, does the, do the line widths of these molecules allow for such a thermalization? And uh, if so, what are the characteristics of the molecules and of the cavities that would allow for that to be seen? Right. So, yeah, I, I, maybe I was uh, overselling what I did a little bit in the beginning, but this, this method can definitely be used to look at the thermalization, but I haven't uh, done it properly because while in this region, you tend to get these kind of weird occupations that are, yeah, that you have lacing at, at finite K or something like that. And so this does not look thermal. And like yeah. this is, does not fit the, the thermal uh, aspect. So um, I haven't really been focusing on or looking for thermalization specifically. So I'm, I'm afraid I can't really answer exactly what but I guess, I, I guess all these effects that you're showing are very kinetic. So my question is like, what, what is what you need? Is it like a cavity that is lower in line width than the molecule or, or, or does that even make sense to use like a cavity that is lower in line width than the molecular line width? The molecular. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I, I I'm not we, sure you would yeah. need that. I, I think, I guess one thing that I guess you would need is, um, that, that the, the speed of thermalization, so the, the rate of the, the thermal thing needs to be fast compared to other things in the system. I'm pretty sure. Like, that's the only thing I can think of. But that's but I, I, I guess my question is with organics, do you think that is possible? I mean, even though we can talk about it offline, but uh, I'm curious about that. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I haven't uh, looked into it enough to, to be able to fully answer, but I, it's something that I am interested in looking into at some point. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so yeah, so that concludes our second uh, Q&A session. Um, if you could um, allow me to share my screen, Christian. Uh, yeah, sorry. Ah, no worries. Okay. All right. Um, so once again, I want to thank both our speakers for presenting today, and I would also like to thank you all for participating and attending this um, webinar. And before we depart, I just want to remind you that our next webinar will feature guest speaker Claudio Hinez from the Max Planck Institute. With that, thank you all.